Hello, YouTube Sidekick here, and welcome to another episode of 70 Years of Moving Mud, the History of Iron Bombing. This is episode 19, The Thunder Rolled. And we are finally getting ready to start getting into, well, the guts of some of the action in the airspace over North Vietnam and in some detail. For what much of what I'm going to talk about today, though, I'm indebted to Max Hastings' book about the whole Vietnam conflict, which is about as finely balanced and honest an analysis as I've found. I'm also relying heavily on two books by James Young about the de development of the suppression of air defense or SEED doctrine in the United States Air Force, over the decades from, say, the mid-50s to the mid-90s, you can find references to all of these books in the description of the episode. I do try to maintain an up-to-date bibliography there. Now, I, I do want to go back and give a little bit of context because we've been talking a bunch of, about a bunch of different things over the last few episodes. So I'm just going to go recap some things. Um, you'll recall that a couple episodes ago, I delved into the nuances of the U.S.'s gradual involvement in the conflict in Vietnam, drawing parallels between it and the war in Korea. Uh, these wars are often viewed as distincts, but I think they're actually kind of part of, uh, kind of like interlinked chapters of a broader uh, narrative. In the episode that I talked about it, I made the point that understanding this connection is important to grasp the full scope of what happened in Vietnam, especially regarding air power strategies, and we'll come back to that a little bit more later in the episode. Now, both Vietnam and Korea emerged from their colonial histories with the distrust of Western imperialism. That's important to know. And that's really a lot of what fueled the communism's appeal in the two countries. And they really did represent the Cold War's division into the world of the world into spheres of influence. They were both on the border between the West and the communist bloc. Now, the U.S. approach to the air war in both cases actually stemmed from its experience in World War II, particularly its uh, part in the strategic bombing campaign against Nazi Germany, and then later its campaign against Japan. Now, these strategic bombing campaigns focused on degrading the enemy's infrastructure and isolating the battlefield. Uh, it was seen as having been a key component of Nazi Germany's eventual collapse, although later studies maybe disputed that claim to some extent. There's no doubt, though, that a similar strategy was applied in Korea and then in Vietnam where it proved far less effective against adversaries with different logistical and economic setups than Germany had had. This episode, I'm going to argue that the U.S.'s failure to learn from the Korean War significantly impacted its military strategies in Vietnam, and this lack of adaptation, coupled with the political dynamics and the evolving nature of warfare, set the stage for a prolonged conflict and challenges in Vietnam. I keep coming back to these points, I know I do, because I really do believe that they are really important in order to understand what happened in Vietnam. Too often, the histories of that conflict, especially the personal histories, tend to focus on the proximate causes of the challenges, particularly that the United States Air Force faced. But they ignore the decades that went before, and they also tend to absolve all of those who made the fateful decisions in those decades that led to some of the pernicious problems that could not be solved in Vietnam. Okay, so again... Just to review briefly where things stood in Vietnam in 1965, to set the stage for the curtain going up on the main event. By, say, February of 1965, the Johnson administration, newly inaugurated after an election in November of 1964, remember that, was committed, at least privately, to armed intervention in Vietnam, or in Southeast Asia, as it would later colloquially be known. This commitment, though, was really, in some ways, the most acceptable answer that it could find to a pretty inescapable conundrum. I mean, ultimately, the U.S. administration wanted to defend South Vietnam against communism. They honestly believed that communism had to be stopped, and that South Vietnam was the weak spot in freedom's defensive wall. The problem was that the South Vietnamese regime was largely indefensible. The leaders of the Republic of Vietnam were selfish, autocratic, corrupt, and uh, militarily incompetent. On the other hand, the, their adversaries, the communist leadership in North Vietnam, were, yes, autocratic, dogmatic, and uninterested in the suffering that they caused, but they were also passionately committed to a wider ideal that gave regular people something to believe in and fight for. They were also much more skilled militarily, and they were well informed about their adversaries in the South. They knew how to exploit the weaknesses of their opponent, and they did so mercilessly. Thus, if the U.S. pulled out 
they acknowledged that the regime in the South was, uh, because they acknowledged that the regime in the South wasn't worth saving, they would lose because the North would easily oust the regime and replace it with communism. If, on the other hand, the U.S. continued to support the regime, they would almost certainly be on the losing side because the army of the Republic of Vietnam was inept and incapable of defending any portion of the country outside the dense urban areas. The only other option was, effectively, to take over the armed portion of the conflict from the ARVN and to use U.S. air power to convince the North that winning the South was not worth the price they would have to pay. Which brings us up to date. So it's time to talk about how that use uh, of American air power was supposed to work, and then we need to talk about what actually happened. In the early part of 1965, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington were told to prepare for full U.S. commitment to the conflict in Vietnam. As part of that commitment, the United States Air Force and the United States Naval Aviation were tasked with carrying out an operation dubbed Rolling Thunder, the air campaign against North Vietnam. It was to be initiated sometime in the spring of 1965. The objectives of Rolling Thunder were clearly laid out, but maybe they weren't all that well defined when you look at them. It was to be a sustained bombing campaign aimed at crippling North Vietnam's ability to supply and reinforce guerrillas in the South. The U.S. wanted to cut off the flow of men and materials, damage industrial infrastructure, and pressure North Vietnam into negotiating a peace settlement or at least staying out of things in the South. Rolling Thunder was also about boosting the sagging morale of the South Vietnamese. The operation was a strategic move to show force and commitment in the face of communist expansion in Southeast Asia. As such, it was an operation whose measurable material and military objectives were actually not all that clear. Also, I maintain it was an operation that was not at all designed to use air power in the way that it was most effective, which is, I maintain, in support of troops and operations on the ground. I've talked about this before, particularly in the aftermath of World War II and the Korean conflict, So, but I am going to just summarize it again here. I think if you look at what was achieved in those conflicts, you can see that the value of air power tends to decrease the farther you are from the front. In World War II, the Allies spent an immense amount of resources and lives on strategic bombing campaigns over both Germany and Japan. These campaigns resulted in the destruction on a massive scale on the ground. This was an embodiment of the bomber mafia doctrine that air power alone could win wars by removing the enemy's capacity and desire to fight. With the sole exception of the atomic bombs, though, strategic bombing was actually remarkably ineffective at achieving its stated goals. The bombing of Germany did not prevent its industrial output from rising in 1943 and 44. The firebombing of Japanese cities did not prevent Japan from being able to produce the weapons that it needed to defend it, its homeland. In neither case did the bombing campaign measurably reduce the target population's desire to continue to wage the war. If anything, it increased them. Now, the sole exception to that was the atomic bomb. And that, and that alone, seemed to prove the bomber mafia right. And so, after World War II, Curtis LeMay and the other strategic bombing advocates, of which there were many, were very much in the ascendant, and not only in the United States, but elsewhere as well. But their arguments, whether they acknowledged it or not, depended critically on the use of the atomic option. But then in Korea, when the atomic option was off the table, the strategic bombing campaign went right back to being effective at leveling buildings, but incredibly wasteful in terms of men and machines, and pretty much ineffective at having any measurable impact on the conduct or length of the war. These facts do not seem to have been present in the minds of the politicians or the minds of the military that planned Operation Rolling Thunder. Now, similarly, both the war in Western Europe and particularly the Korean War had proven that isolation of the war theater at a strategic level was actually not all that effective a use of air power. Now, it was more effective in Germany and Western Europe in 1944 and 45 than it was in North Korea in 1950, but this was, you know, because of the modern industrialized economies in Northwest Europe depended on a more industrial scale infrastructure, which was reasonably easy to identify and target and hard to repair once it was destroyed. Still, even here, 
the enemy proved remarkably skillful and innovative in finding ways to move priority cargoes around blockages. There's no doubt that the strategic uh, interdiction campaign had an impact, but that impact ended up being arguably much less than was assumed at the time. And achieving those results required a truly massive commitment of resources that actually has never again been equaled. The story in Korea was actually much less positive than that. Again, an immense amount of effort, one might even say a preponderance of effort, at least from the summer of 1951 onward, anyway, a huge effort, went into attempting to isolate the North Korean and Chinese forces from their supply bases in China. But those efforts were never really that effective. Ground forces at the front never suffered serious shortages of basic needs for ammo and food, and were even able to build stockpiles necessary for limited offensive operations. The North Korean transportation infrastructure was not very sophisticated, but that also meant that it was easy to disguise and also easy to repair when locally sourced resources and locally sourced labor were available. Once it was clear that the U.S. strategy, what the strategy was going to be, the North Korean response was to mobilize nationally with the objective of repairing or rerouting traffic as necessary when the existing infrastructure was attacked. Furthermore, it gave the North Koreans an excellent opportunity to draw the U.S. into a war of attrition, allowing them essentially to bait flak traps with seemingly important infrastructure targets and then waiting for the U.S. air power to take the bait. In the end, these targets were relatively cheap and easy to replace, and the U.S. airplanes and pilots that were lost destroying them were not. It was an uneven exchange that seems to have largely been lost on U.S. military planners. It was not lost on the North Koreans or their communist allies, including North Vietnam. As a result, when it became clear that the U.S. was contemplating a similar bombing campaign against North Vietnam, and let's be clear, U.S. intentions were obvious or discernible to anyone who wanted to investigate them, you know, down to a fairly high level of detail. Once the North Vietnamese regime knew what was coming, they enlisted the help of other communist countries, including North Korea, in preparing for the onslaught. From Russia, they got both anti-aircraft systems and training and advice on how to use them. From the Chinese, they got similar support and also combat aircraft and training on how to use those, and critically, very substantial support in the form of workers and resources to repair and maintain transportation infrastructure between North Vietnam and China. From North Korea, they got very valuable, and I think often overlooked, advice on how to prepare to survive and even thrive under a sustained air attack. This advice caused the regime to set up a national agency, literally, to coordinate infrastructure repair and to draft, by force, massive numbers of laborers to carry it out. In fact, it is arguable that the Hanoi regime imposed massive food shortages on its own population by taking what labor hadn't been drafted into the army, mostly women, away from the job of raising crops to give them the job of repairing bridges and rail yards. It caused them to uh, also make detailed plans on how to reroute the traffic and also to investigate makeshift repair techniques that could be implemented quickly when bridges or roads were destroyed. And it also caused them to stockpile repair materials in locations near to critical or obvious targets. Apparently, none of this was obvious to U.S. planners. From top to bottom, they viewed their enemy as unsophisticated and unprepared for the thunder that was about to roll over them. And this, I think, points out one area in the air war in Vietnam and the wider Vietnam War in which the U.S. operated at a significant disadvantage and maybe one that they never really tried seriously to overcome, and that was actually the intelligence battle. The U.S. certainly possessed some sophisticated intelligence-gathering resources at a tactical and even operational level, mostly in the form of electronic warfare assets, but these were not used much at the outset of operations, and they were never really used beyond trying to gather kind of proximate information relevant to ongoing operations. In contrast, the North Vietnamese developed and maintained not only a sophisticated radar and early warning system to track U.S. activity in real time, like, for instance, having fishing boats watching U.S. carriers in the Gulf of Tonkin, but they also developed and maintained a very effective human intelligence gathering network. Now, partly because of extremely low uh, OPSEC on the U.S. side, uh, 
The North had very little trouble in penetrating headquarters and installations at virtually every level, both in Vietnam and in Thailand. They were not only aware of U.S. strategic intent, I mean, thanks to Western media, this was practically public domain, but they also had timely access to things like target lists and target priorities. More than that, um, by actually having observers who could listen to casual conversations, they also knew an awful lot about the tactics that were used, or might be, and how the U.S. thought these tactics were working. And they also knew a lot about frontline aircrew morale and frontline aircrew mindset. In short, they were way inside the decision loop, or as a fighter pilot would call it, the OODA loop, when it came to adjusting tactics, techniques, and procedures. In short, the North Vietnamese did an excellent job of predicting not only U.S. priorities and plans, but also local-level tactics and responses. They were rarely surprised. When they were, it was quite unpleasant. The U.S., on the other hand, was relatively poorly informed. They worked on the basis of past behaviors and assumptions and almost continually, at least until the end, vastly underestimated their adversary. In this area, at least, the U.S. was truly, uh, well and truly, outplayed. It really wasn't evident, though, until much later how important this was in determining the outcome. Okay, with that context out of the way, let's take a look at how the thunder really got rolling. For this episode, I'm going to concentrate on the Air Force side of the operation. The Navy effectively ran its own operation in parallel, so we'll need to look at that in a separate episode. To begin with, it was decided that the aircraft that would strike North Vietnam would be not be based in South Vietnam, they'd be based in Thailand. That's important to remember. Um, this at first may seem like a strange decision. It complicated planning and execution dramatically. Flight times would be longer. Refueling would be required. Sortie rates would be reduced. In general, it would make the effort a lot less efficient. The rationale for it, though, was actually pretty straightforward, if a bit unfortunate. And that was that the Air Force <laughs> didn't trust the South Vietnamese, effectively. Uh, from the boots that were already on the ground, it was clear to the United States Air Force that a presence in South Vietnam was going to be an irresistible target for the Viet Cong, and that the RVN, ARVN could not protect those assets effectively, and that the number of U.S. troops that would be required to protect them would be prohibitive if the Military Assistance Command in Vietnam, known as MACV, wanted to do anything else at all. So the Air Force went to Thailand. Now, although the United States Air Force eventually operated from as many as eight bases in Thailand, in 1965 there was only one base, Tak Le, that hosted a permanent tactical fighter wing. This was the 355th, which operated F-105s and had a nominal strength of 72 aircraft in three squadrons. Now, even at the start, it was recognized that this force would be insufficient for the job at hand, so a provisional tactical fighter wing was stood up at Karat Royal Thai Air Force Base, and this was the 6234th provisional tactical fighter wing. Now, at least to me, it's a measure of how far the United States Air Force underestimated the magnitude of the task that, in effect, there was really only one wing that was assigned to the job on a permanent basis. Now, this would eventually grow to four full tactical fighter wings, and a host of ancillary and support organizations as well, to the point that by the end of the first Rolling Thunder, there were more Air Force personnel in Thailand than in Vietnam, and the United States Air Force had effectively become a mainstay of the Thai economy. This arrangement, though, meant that the command arrangements for this force were also, um, shall we say, not straightforward. The wings in Thailand were initially part of the 2nd Division of the Pacific Air Forces, or PACAF, they would eventually be part of the 7th Air Force, but again in 1965, when Rolling Thunder began, there was no numbered Air Force-level command responsible for the operation. So this left a gap, because it meant that MACV, as the organization responsible for Vietnam, the Vietnam Theater, didn't have any air component command. Instead, the aircraft were being controlled from PACAF in Honolulu. This was, as they say, suboptimal. Eventually, the 7th Air Force was stood up to be the Air Component Command reporting to MACV, and it was supposed to have operational control of all operations. The 7th Air Force headquarters was at Tan Son Nut Air Base in South Vietnam. In practice, though, the bases and wings in Thailand were attached for logistical support to the 13th Air Force, which was headquartered in the Philippines. Once again, this hybrid organization made sense to someone, somewhere, at some time. But for the air crew at the pointy end, it was again not at all an optimal, optimal arrangement. Now, their targeting priorities came from one HQ 
from which they were separated by hostile territory. They had no contact with the theater command that they were supposed to support. Their supply of ordnance and pilots came through a different Air Force headquarters. and They also, frankly, continued to receive at least some level of oversight from PACAF itself because PACAF was the H crew Q through which the Joint Chiefs transmitted their priorities and concerns of the political leadership who viewed Rolling Thunder as a strategic operation over which they needed to exert high-level control. It is not hard, at least for me, at all, to imagine that the commander of a tactical fighter wing who wanted his primary job to be keeping his air crew alive in the hostile sky over North Vietnam, while attempting to engage the targets he was sent, to find that he was spending his days dealing in no particular order with the base commander, who was a Thai Air Force senior officer but who controlled everything from the military police to the food and housing for a wing, the wing commander's 2,000 personnel to the 7th Air Force headquarters, wanting to know what was flying where and then why, to reading PACAF messages to the 7th Air Force, in which he was copied, expressing defined and specific opinions not only on what targets to engage, but how, and then to having full and frank exchanges of views with the 13th Air Force logistics in the Philippines, in which he implored them to stop sending him the ordinance they thought he needed because of how they thought he should run this war, and to start sending him the stuff he actually needed to run it the way PACAF told him he should. Seriously, that was probably an average day. All of which bears witness to the fact that when it started, the effort required to execute Rolling Thunder was seriously underestimated by United States Air Force commanders and planners. At any rate, in early March 1965, the Thunder did begin to roll across North Vietnam. Strike packages from Thailand and from Yankee Station in the Gulf of Tonkin began fanning out across North Vietnam, targeting military installations. The Air Force executed its uh, attacks in a fashion as close to the way as they'd been trained to attack the Soviet Union on the opening day of the nuclear conflict uh, as possible. After taking off from Thailand, they transited neutral Laos at altitude and then descended to low level for ingress to their assigned targets. They flew low and fast, and they executed pop-up attacks close to the target and dive-bombed them. The thud, as the F-105 was affectionately, or less so, known, proved to be uh, that it was well designed for this mission. It could fly low, it could fly fast, oh my, it could fly fast, especially once it dropped its bomb load. The F-105 was, and would remain actually for a long time, the fastest aircraft in the sky, below 10,000 feet. It also proved that it could carry an ample bomb load, although it did reveal that it was less than comfortable doing this, with a load consisting of multiple 750-pound bombs distributed across the belly and wing pylons, as opposed to the single nuclear weapon in its internal bomb bay, which is what it had been designed to do. In this configuration, the extra drag made it substantially slower and less maneuverable, um, and, and that's a fact that would become an issue as time went on. The initial raids were, largely, successful, although to be fair, they were launched against a reasonably soft targets, against which the enemy, you know, an enemy that still wasn't all that well prepared. Even still, though, the initial experience revealed uh, some harbingers of things to come, both in terms of the combat environment and some of the less than desirable features of the F-105. In the first place, North Vietnam proved to be a very restrictive operating environment. The targets were mostly clustered in a few main locations, and the terrain around those locations provided only really very limited numbers of low-level, uh, low-altitude ingress routes. This meant that it very quickly became possible for the North Vietnamese to predict where the planes would be, and in fact, probably almost when they would be there, given that the range from the Thai air bases only provided a limited window of launch times in order to perform the entire strike in daylight. Thus, even with relatively few and relatively unsophisticated uh, anti-aircraft artillery weapons available, the North Vietnamese were able to concentrate them in the path of incoming strikes. This meant that the same AAA that crews saw, the same AAA crews saw the same behavior from the same kinds of aircraft over and over again. And although they learned that it was very difficult to hit fast-moving jets, they also learned that it wasn't impossible. F-105 crews, on the other hand, learned an uncomfortable fact about their aircraft. Although they were much bigger and more powerful than the warbirds of old, they were also not nearly as tough. The piston-engine fighters of World War II and Korea had been able to take punishment, 
especially the big radial engine versions like the P-47 and the Corsair. They had had relatively few really vulnerable spots, and those that they did have were actually often well enough armored to take a hit, at least from a 50 caliber machine gun. But this wasn't true of the F-105. The new breed of fighters was much more complex. It depended on complex hydraulic and electrical systems that ran through the wings, the fuselage, and the tail of the aircraft. These systems were protected only by the thin aerodynamic skin of the aircraft, and they featured limited or really no redundancy. If a hydraulic line in the wing or tail end of the fuselage was even nicked by a small caliber projectile, the entire hydraulic system would drain fluid, the aircraft would become impossible to control, and in very short order the aircrew would have to, uh, no have no choice but to eject, probably over hostile enemy territory, they might survive, but only as POWs. This extreme vulnerability should not have been unexpected, but it was never seen as a significant issue somehow, because a decade of training and development had convinced USAF planners that AAA was no longer much more than a nuisance to a jet like the THUD. For a decade, they'd been planning to fly low-level surgical strikes in the first moments of a tactical nuclear war against targets distributed across northwestern Europe, or northeastern Europe, I guess. The targets were relatively far apart. The terrain allowed for lots of options for ingress, and the AAA available could hardly protect them all. And besides, the location of any real concentrations of AAA would probably be known in advance. The AAA crews might be well-trained or not, but they would have really no experience shooting at fast-moving, low-flying United States Air Force jets, and they wouldn't have a chance to get any because the war would be over after maybe one or two sorties. All of this allowed Air Force planners and pilots to treat AAA basically as more of a nuisance uh, that should be avoided rather than a threat that would, be need to, uh, that would need to be survived. It was assumed, reasonably, that the unsophisticated defenses present in North Vietnam could not possibly pose more of a threat than the ones in Warsaw Pact countries. But the first few days of operations challenged almost every one of those assumptions. Since the targets were clustered and the terrain restrictive, there were very few choices for ingress routes for all strike packages, so certain choke points on those ingress routes were overflown literally dozens of times a day, allowing the North Vietnamese to concentrate their uh, antique weapons in very few locations and giving gunners world-class experience in a very short period of time. The situation became exponentially more dangerous as the Soviets and Chinese began to ramp up the supply of newer AAA guns that could be, and were, controlled by fire can radars, which they also supplied in quantity. In a very short time, literally weeks, AAA became much more than a nuisance to be avoided. It became a threat to be survived or defeated. The sad fact was that this was not a situation for which the United States Air Force was prepared. The F-105 proved that it was not a platform that could survive encounters with AAA of any caliber. And the United States Air Force discovered that it had neither the training nor the tools to effectively suppress AAA defenses. It was literally not a mission that the Air Force uh, had prepared for. They did not have a we the weapons that were well adapted to the task, and they didn't have pilots who were practiced in the art of deploying those weapons. At the start of Rolling Thunder, the only ordnance available to the strike aircraft in Thailand in any quantity were 750-pound bombs fused for point detonation. Now, while useful for facilities and infrastructure targets, they were not very well suited to attacking small point targets like AAA ins installations, especially if they were dug in at all. The point detonating bombs could move a lot of earth and would definitely get gun crews' attention, but unless they were dropped almost on top of the gun positions, which were not only small, but usually well camouflaged and difficult to spot, they were unlikely to cause casualties or permanent damage to the guns themselves. The only other options that were available, and not in quantity, were napalm and rockets. And although the F-105 could carry both, most pilots had little or no experience using them. And, given the supply situation, there wasn't a lot going spare to practice with. Plus, these were not really very popular choices, because they tended to have a um, dramatic and shortening effect on the life expectancy of the pilots who deployed them. 
Napalm required a low-level pass to deliver effectively, uh, and it had to be a level pass. And rockets required a shallow, constant dive, once again, at a pretty low level. Neither of these attack profiles was, or is for anyone who's ever tried it in DCS, a good choice in the face of alert and experienced AAA gunners, especially when they have lots of friends in the neighborhood. There was a further problem of simply having enough aircraft to do the job of flak suppression properly. Uh, with flak traps distributed all along the ingress routes uh, and in the vicinity of practically all of the major targets, it would have required sending more uh, iron hands than actual strike aircraft to have a chance of suppressing them all. It soon became clear, in theater, that the Cold War mission profile was simply not appropriate for the situation that air crews faced. So, strikes began to be planned using a high-level ingress followed by a dive-bombing run on the target area to minimize exposure to AAA fire. Now, the downside of this approach was that it gave the North Vietnamese air defense even more advanced notice because the strike packages could now be detected on radar as they formed up and their routes and targets were generally pretty predictable. It also put the thuds in a flight regime um, that was not their natural home. Above 10,000 feet, the thud was much less impressive than at low altitude, and fully loaded, um, they weren't particularly fast, and they certainly were not agile. Which would have been a problem if there were enemy fighters about, which was a concern, both in Thailand and in Washington, but at least in the early days it wasn't much of a threat, although, like so many things, that would change. But flying above 10,000 feet also put the strike packages in another form of harm's way the surface-to-air missile. And this fact became brutally apparent on the 24th of July, 1965, when an F-4C Phantom, call sign Leopard 2, was destroyed by an SA-2, a guideline or Davina, depending on your preference for naming conventions, but an SA-2 surface-to-air missile. It was, quite literally, a shot heard round the world. It is no exaggeration to say that in that moment the world of air combat was changed literally forever in small and large ways that are still very much with us today. So, uh, that's where we're going to pick up the story next time. In the next episode, we'll talk about the rise of the SAM and how an outdated weapon system, which is what the SA-2 was, operated by an underdeveloped country, became an existential threat to the most powerful and advanced air force that money could buy. That's next time on Moving Mud, a history of iron bombing podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again soon.